regret nothing. Welcome to the Running With Scissors I Regret Nothing podcast with Vince Desi, Mike J, and Kurt Willoughby. How are you doing, guys? We are back with our <coughs> third edition of the Running With Scissors I Regret Nothing podcast. Uh, this week... We've got Vince back as always, calling in from Mexico. How you doing, Vinny? Hello, hello, Vince. Vince, can you hear me? Vince, have you muted me? All right. Well, Kurt, how are you? I'm very well. Vince, how are you? You can't hear us. Hey. No, I got the. We got this cat. I mean, not that I'm the biggest fan of cats, but this cat. He's a stray cat. And he's been coming around a house and, you know, we feed him. So he's over here now. Maybe I'll put him on the air. Yeah, Maybe uh, I could stick an ash can up his ass. cat running yeah. around the house. Right no, he's, now. A good, he's a good looking cat. Well, the last, the last cat she had here, that's my, uh, my girl's daughter. The, the dogs ate it. You know, these dogs ate it. It was, um, well, that's good. There's a lot of, you know, one thing, you know, you're in Mexico when there's a lot of dogs loose on the street. Yeah, that's what I always remember about Mexico. Whenever we would yeah, no, there, true. Would just be dogs. So, are we on? Are we? Did you do an yeah, intro? Yeah, I, I introduded like, you, but you weren't listening. Oh, so, or you were muted. Oh, well, yeah, I was. I was. I was <laughs> obsessed with you know with the cat. Yeah, I figured. So, so anyway, let's start again. Uh, we're here with Vince. Desi. <laughs> Say hi, Vince. Hey, how's everybody doing? I'm glad to be here, and I really do appreciate. Uh, just everything. It's amazing. I'm like in a spiritual mood. I'm returning from the Yucatan. It's like jungle fever. It's a beautiful thing. He's in. He was in Tulum, Tulum, Mexico, which I believe. Don't where say they, where I. You were. I you're not there anymore. Yeah. But that's where they and shoot I, I'm not the doing Corona commercials, I believe. I have no idea. Yeah, that's what I heard. Anyway, uh, we've also got our newest host today is the Running with Scissors sound producer Kurt Willoughby, all the way from the bloody UK, just like our third host always seems to be. So, uh, say hello, Kurt. Hello, Kurt. I figured you'd Way to do it, isn't it? Like That's that. how yeah, we do this thing? No. Yeah. Okay. That's how that. you do some things. There so, uh, we got some topics to talk about today. And, and <clears throat> I think I want to rehash what we spoke about last time, which is VR. And I think it's because we've gotten a little deeper in it here. And uh, I've got a couple VR kits here. Kurt has a VR kit. Vince has even played VR now. So, uh, we're all kind of... Um, balls deep in it if you will and uh <clears throat> i don't know it's it's something special it's early on and and it's expensive but it, it's it's something special uh what do you think vince when you first got in there and i i loved it i mean to me it was so uh, it reminded me of uh, the 60s you know taking acid um thinking i could touch stuff but it wasn't there uh, that was my first you know my first real feeling uh, but I really liked it. And then, I don't know if you remember then, I don't know, we were playing the baseball game and I didn't have the controller on my wrist, so I flung it across the room. He I did, mean, you, he it, did it, like a kid playing his Nintendo Wii for the first time and he chucked the remote <laughs> across the room. It was but, uh, uh, pretty epic. No, I listen, I, I like it a lot. I could see myself playing VR games. I mean, it, it was a lot of fun. And I look forward to it becoming a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, it does need yeah, to become I told, cheaper. I, I sent you something yesterday, Kurt. You didn't see this. I sent Jay an email on. There's something called the Homo. I mean, believe it or not. I mean, that was it was some not my mustache. That's not the Homo. Marketing, some marketing <laughs> material I received, and they didn't say exactly what their price point would be, uh, but they were, you know, it's going to be more than a hundred, but it'll be somewhere around two hundred, three hundred bucks. And I I was and it's actually being designed for children, uh, kids, learning, and entertainment. I just think they should really change the name because <laughs> I'm not so sure how that plays around the world, but in America... What are you, sensitive? If I, if I was to tell you, you know, just not look, I'm, look I, I was just, I was just uh, texting you before with Randy. I'm, you know me, I'm, I'm pro everybody, but I'm just saying from a marketing perspective saying... I think for Christmas, I'm going to get my kid the homo VR. 
I don't know. I mean, it's just, I'm just, maybe it's, maybe it's me, you know? Maybe it's playing the with H-O-M-O. The H-O-M-O. Yeah, maybe it's the H-O-M-O or it's, uh, maybe you're misspelling it or something. I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe that's right. Maybe it's a pronunciation issue. That could be it. Maybe it's the H-O-M-O. You know, so you get, but I, uh, I don't. I've, I've been playing a few different games around here lately and, <clears throat> you know, the longbow game in the lab is uh, is pretty epic. I don't know if you've tried that one yet, Kurt, but it's... Uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's really simple. It's just like a just a bow and arrow game, and it's ridiculously addictive, if you will. Beautiful. I'll have to try it next week. Yeah, I mean, a lot of... <clears throat> I think we said this last time, but a lot of the products that are out for VR seem a little bit half-baked. And I can understand... People wanted to rush stuff to market so that it could be there, and it's nice to have things to play, but the games aren't particularly cheap, and they're all pretty mediocre. I mean, I'm not a huge gamer, but I can say that uh, these games are pretty mediocre. What do you think, Kurt? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that statement, to be honest. There's only been like one or two games that actually seem like fully-fledged games I honestly can't pick their names off the top of my head right now um there was one i wish i could remember its name there's one i saw an article about yesterday that is actually the first uh, vr game to hit a million dollars in sales as well uh, but that's 30 bucks to buy it so yeah i don't know i guess we'll have to do our research a little better because you know since we're getting into this vr land we should know these mm. things right so if it grossed a million at a 30 dollar retail at means it would have to sell somewhere around i don't know 35,000 units which obviously in the big scale of things is not a lot but uh it's also early i mean look i'm a little yeah. older than you guys i can remember every time new systems came out i mean you know i started on the 2600 so um it, it's it, unless you have a situation and we'll see what sony does but Back in those earlier days, until Nintendo basically became a, a video game company, and a lot of people may not know it, but Nintendo is over 100 years old, and they were a, a card company, card playing company. Um, but in the 80s, when Nintendo, when the first NES came out, Nintendo had a whole slate of games, and they had Mario, and they, I mean, they, they put so much, you know, the one thing, I, I, I'm a really big fan of Nintendo as a company, because they just devote themselves to such a high level of quality and and support. Um, but we'll see what happens now. But I mean, otherwise, you you know, you really couldn't say that early in the early days of Sega. Um, and then obviously Sony came, you know, post Sega, and they made their own big splash. But well, look, we might great, as well great, actually great. segue that into talking about Sony and their their announcements and their VR and everything and. What <clears throat> what I think they're doing right this time around, and Microsoft's doing the same thing too, is instead of launching a whole new system, so everybody has to guaranteed buy a new system, you know, they're releasing their VR, but it's going to work for both the PlayStation Pro and regular PlayStation 4. So people that want a higher resolution version of their system that'll work on 4K and will run a little bit faster... They can buy a new PlayStation 4 Pro, but they'll be able to get VR and play all the same games on their original PlayStation 4. So it's not just a new system, because it is a new system, but it's going to be playing the exact same games just at a higher resolution. So that, I think, is huge. is a huge win for the industry, especially for the VR industry, because you're not limiting the VR to the upper echelon of game system owners. You're giving it to everybody that's out there. So... You know, there's going to be this, I believe Microsoft is going to be using the Oculus. So people that own an Xbox are going to be able to buy an Oculus. And then people that own a PlayStation 4 are going to be able to buy their VR. And I think that's when this will be able to hit the ground running. Because the PlayStation 4 VR is going to cost $499. Which still isn't pennies. But it's the same cost the system was when it came out. And it will work on and all the systems that are out there. Is, is that coming out for this Christmas? Yes. Yes, right. It's, it's coming so out see that. Month. See that's the key because at Christmas, people will spend. There is a larger segment of the tech buying community that you know up to five hundred during Christmas. They're going to go for it. Whereas right. 
any other time of year, it takes a different type of person to buy a five hundred dollar system. Well, and not just so, that. You, most people program into their gaming budget that give or take every four or five years they're going to buy a new system. And if somebody says, "Well, I have an option of buying a PlayStation Four Pro, but I've already got this PlayStation Four, maybe I should get the VR system instead, and I can maybe yeah. get a Pro later." They'll they'll have an option to try out what the new the new hype is. You know, getting a PS4 Pro, I think, is probably going to be geared towards the top tier people that really want the 4K experience and new system buyers. Whereas existing system buyers, for the most part, will probably just opt for the VR if they want to enter that realm. So, and, and what will just the VR cost? Four ninety nine. Okay. Now, what about uh, for the for the benefit of everybody? paying attention or at least viewing speak to the whole oculus and the vive and how will and any cross-platform compatibility what, well, what's gonna happen this actually came as news to us in the last couple of weeks but um you know we've been graciously given uh tech units of the oculus touch controls and as it turns out they actually do play Vive games. So when a game is designed for Vive, meaning it has complete touch controls, two, two controllers not using like a little Xbox controller, you can now do that with the Oculus as well. Uh, those aren't out yet and they will be out, but it is a good news for uh, Oculus owners that soon enough they will be able to play all the existing Vive games with their existing systems. So, so what, what you have then is you've got this PC-based audience for Vive and Oculus, and Sony's going to be supporting their own platform. The question mm -hmm. becomes, what happens, wh when will Microsoft release theirs, or if they're going to do some packaging with Oculus? And so Oculus will support Vive slash, it will also support Xbox? Well, no, no. So, <laughs> Oculus is just a peripheral, and the system itself well, comes with a Microsoft Xbox 360 or Xbox One controller because that's how games are designed to be played on it originally. You wear the headset and you play with a controller. Um, going forward, they're coming out with their touch controllers, which I'm actually not positive if they're going to start packaging it with it or it's going to be a completely separate purchase. But you will have the ability to use two separate handheld touch controllers like you can with the Vive. <clears throat> those two things combined mean you can play games that were originally just designed for the Vive. That said, those same games will then, I'm sure, be ported over for the Xbox One once so, do, the Oculus. Do you have the uh, game controller for the Oculus at the office when I get back next week? Yes, yes, yes. You can I want to try it. I, I mean, just off the top of my head, I, I really enjoyed having the free hand control yeah. that the Vive, I mean, it was just... It was so easy and intuitive. I mean, it just, I mean, the idea of having to fucking hold a, a pad and playing, it's like jerking off in a whorehouse. I mean, there's no point. You yeah, know, I've, I, I've had I, quite I, a few I, I people, just, I've had quite a few people come into the office because they're like, oh, I want to check out VR. And every one of them does the same thing. They first put it on and they just are like, holy shit. But, and even when I, the games are stupid and even when the games are simple, they are like, this is fucking awesome. And I've had a, quite a few people come in that are just like, I wasn't planning on getting this. Now I'm going to go see what I can sell at home so I can buy one of these. And I yeah, laugh just because, you know, for me, I'm like, <laughs> it's cool, but $800 is a lot plus the $1,300 entry point for a computer. But uh, I'm glad I, I want people to buy it because, you know, we're obviously working on it and uh, we would like there to be a bigger user base. It's going to happen. It will. It's it's it's. Yeah, you know, it, it's definitely. I have, I have complete faith in it. I mean, that's. Uh, it, it, it absolutely will. Fucking Kurt, you've been a little As quiet. Why don't you butt in here, huh? I can't butt in. I'm British. I gotta wait my turn. What do you, you see? That's you Canadian. Remember. That's Canadian. Yeah. Well, I'm. By the way, no, I'm, no, I'm, still I'm, I'm. I'm drinking tea. Because... I'm drinking coffee. And I'm drinking see, iced coffee here. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But no, um, as you said earlier, that it is very much in its early stages, and the thing is, is that all other kind of forms of gaming that you you could reach to a certain level, and then everyone got the platform for that level, and then it advanced, and you, it just kept going up and developing on the same kind of plane. Whereas this is something so new, basically everyone is the test market. 
no one really knows what they're doing and everyone's just experimenting at the same time and that's what kind of makes it kind of scary for those who are really um um what's the word uh, devoted to it and putting all, everything into it but it's also extremely exciting because it means that it's also the consumers that are shaping it so yeah but, i mean you yeah the, those, I, I did have a, a small argument with somebody recently about this and you know, talking about getting in at the ground floor and all this. And they were like, well, a lot of people got in at the ground floor of, you know, PlayStation Move and Xbox Connect stuff. And those things have never really taken oh, yeah. off. And I'm thinking to myself, like, this isn't, this isn't the same, right? I mean, yeah, Different. we did it too. But it's not, it's, you know, even playing something as simple as mini golf on there or home run derby. And I used to play a lot of home run derby and stuff on, on Wii. Like, it's not the same. <laughs> It's not the same as looking at a TV and swinging your controller. I mean, you're doing the same swinging, but you're completely immersed in it, and it's just a very different experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I told you. It was – yeah, I, I believe that Timothy Leary is dead. Um, that was even, I think, a lyric in a song. But I'm telling you, for people that um, – like want a good acid trip. Want to experiment with drugs or know what it's like, I'm telling you, the v, put on that VR headset – I could just imagine what a great soundtrack. I mean, it's it really brought back memories of when I was younger and tripping and, you know, things that I did while I was tripping and trying Dude, to touch stuff. I couldn't imagine having that headset on when you're on an acid trip. That would be no, out I, of I don't, control. I don't, I'm not talking about tripping and putting. And I am. But you're, you're going to do it. I'm going to rent a but service. I'm, I'm going to tell people to come here, do their acid, and put my VR headset Put them in the studio. <laughs> that's right. That sounds, that sounds interesting. Okay. Mo the, mo the Molly, you know, the it's Molly like a safe studio. House. It's like a safe house. We inject you. Oh, and that's, you, you know. Okay. It's all that. Shoot so dope. anyway. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Shoot Jay. dope here. I was going to say, um, Vince mentioned about um, the soundtrack in VR. This is obviously my area's sound but it's actually something that uh, seems really interesting is people are now developing 3d audio headphones and um, i've i've actually backed uh, something called the osic x which is coming out in november and because they did a kickstarter sure it is and what sure it, it is everything says they're uh, coming out at a certain <laughs> time it never ever ever does well uh, it's uh, i hope it's going to come out because i paid a lot of money for it I but either way it's um <laughs> basically it's like um the, the sounds that you're hearing are placed within a 3D environment and you can actually move around it. It has head tracking. It actually uh, has a program that it runs with with your computer. So it actually uh, knows the shape of your head or the size of your head. So it can do like body absorption of sounds and all this. Um, the one that I find really exciting is I saw, uh, see if I can find the name of it. It was the Entrum 4D headphones were announced at the uh, S by uh, South by Southwest convention, mm -hmm. uh, these are still in development. They've got no date, but uh, they they're actually using this thing called it galvanic vestibular stimulation, and uh, what it is it sends vibrations through your ear and affects the balancing uh, the balancing part of your ear canal. Oh, it actually fucks you up. Yeah, I saw that is, yesterday. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's great if Vince hasn't seen it, I don't know. Um, Drugless but, but showed, drugs. Yeah. They showed someone uh, with a VR headset seeing first-person view of going like around a race course with normal headphones on. They were just sat there watching it. Then they put these uh, Entrim 4Ds on, which affect your balance. So as he was going around corners, he was actually like swaying to the sides and thinking, like he's uh, um, fooling his body into thinking that it was actually being thrown around these corners and all this. The, 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 apparently the original idea was to combat motion sickness, which you get if you sat still using a controller like the Oculus is planning. But the fact it can actually make you think you're moving around in the world as well seems really cool to me, yeah, at least. That is cool. I, you know, another thing I was thinking along the, uh, you know, doing drugs and putting on the headset, one other thing that would be cool, and I'm sure they're already doing it, this is just me spitballing, is... You know, having 3D cameras set up at festivals, concerts, and, you know, you can pay for an experience just by sitting in your room and putting on your headset and watching a whole show, being able to look around. Uh -huh. Like, I'm, I'm sure it's being done. I'm just, you know, thinking out loud about it, so. 
I, I say I, the only I, problem is with these headphones is that obviously it adds another layer of expense to all if you want to experience it, uh, it in that. You're an audiophile. There's a lot of layers of expense to things that you do. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a lot of layers of expense to anything we do as game developers in general. But Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> so but anyway, I, I, let, I, sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, I, I think a real key element to what's going on now, it's been at least the past 12 months that VR is becoming a topic that, you know, I mean, my God, you could be pick up a, a consumer magazine or watch a stupid TV show. The, you know, the VR concept, it's becoming in everyone's conscience so much more globally. And what Kurt was saying earlier, you know, regarding the video game industry, and uh, I hate using that term, you know, changing the whole uh, dynamic of things, but this really is different. I mean, you know, there was Pong in 1974, okay? And since Pong, of course, you had, you know, from arcade machines to computers to uh, basically devoted game systems, you know, and just under that devoted game system, you could throw all of them in there as far as I'm concerned. And now you've gotten to another level. This is, you know, VR is truly something else. So it's not just new, it is something different. And I think a big, a big factor here is the video game industry is about 40 years old. I mean, people don't realize that. So we have a 40 year foundation from people like myself that started with Pong to today's audience where, I mean, all you have to do is be at an airport and you'll see a couple with a child and the kid is one years old and they either have a phone, some form of a phone, or they've got some type of a pad. The kid's fucking 12 months. My, my nephew's months. only 10 months and he has his own iPad. Okay. So this is my whole point. The audience is is there this is the, you, you you know everybody i mean people in my age group they'll be more hesitant or but even that i think you'll always have people that are are willing to take a you know try something new so i really do think that this is technology speaking in terms of the entertainment industry and it's not like going to see a 3d movie look movies are movies are movies okay that's just a fact so they get better all the time blah 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 but VR, when I put that friggin' headset on in the office, I, for the first time since I was maybe 14 when I first tripped, I, I felt like I was actually in another reality. A whole not, new world. Not necessarily alternate. Not, I, I don't even want to consider it virtual because the fact is if you're living it, it's real. So... But yeah. anyway, time, time John, to move John on. actually just sent me an article, and uh, in China, the VR business is, like, booming because they have arcades that are using VR now all over the place. So, you know, in a place like that where there's that many people, you know, it's just going to it's just gonna filter out here. These same things. All those facial there. herpes. Mm, yeah, give me what <laughs> everybody's got. VR herpes. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'll um, pass. Anyway, let's move on to our next topic. We're going to get on to a little <clears throat> leave the games industry for a little bit. We're going to move on to the cell phone industry. And me and Cart, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt. And Curtis had a Thanks. spirited Thanks. argument earlier on the uh, iPhone versus Android controversy because he wanted to know how excited I was for my iPhone 7 to get here. And I was like, well... It's one I tried thing to ask me. a nice general question and you, you jumped You British down my throat. fucking people, you're all movie villains and you think you're asking nice questions and you're just being cheeky and dickheaded. And uh, anyway, I said, well, my iPhone 7 Plus is getting here tomorrow, but I've felt tech deficient for a week now because my mother and my fiance both have an iPhone 7 and I don't. So for the last couple of days, I've been this slacker. I've been this tech talk guy that works for a video game company. And I don't even have the latest in technology. And then Kurt made some bullshit comment about how iPhones suck. So I did not. Say I that. reached across <laughs> the camera and bitch slapped him because he just wanted. Let's to see talk. that. Let's see that. <laughs> 
Anyway, uh, we just had a, a, a mild discussion about the differences between iPhone and Android. And me being a extreme user, meaning I have had many Android phones and many iPhones, and him being a very limited user, racist, <laughs> if you will, he's only used Android, so he's racist. He's a- He's a bigoted, uh, he's a, a bigoted phoner. He is a very limited worldview, bigoted Android user, and uh, he's just like, oh, I just love it. It's it's better, and it's like, well, I mean, you'd <laughs> know like that if you'd use both. And then he, oh, well, buy me an iPhone. I'm, well, here's the thing, uh, and this uh, is what I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna butt in here. The thing is, you're uh, saying that, or well, making out that I'm saying. That Android is the best one. I wasn't saying that in the slightest. I just said I've been happy with my Android, but I haven't had an iPhone. Yeah, I mean, people were happy with a lot of things for a while, but you know what? Sometimes you got to move into the 21st century here, pal. Android, the problem with Android, and this is what I'm going to, this is the, my personal opinion as me and Kurt decided earlier that this is not the general consensus, it's a personal opinion, but the reason why Android as a whole is a problem is because they are designing an operating system. They are not designing a phone. They are not in control of the hardware. They are only trying to license the software and they have to license the software all over the place and it has to work for X thousand phones at this point which means it's not optimized for any of them, which means it has problems. And it's why Android manufacturers, Sony, Google themselves, Motorola, Sony, they have to, um, they have to put out all these new features in the hardware. This, oh, we've got four gigs of RAM. Oh, we've got the best 4K OLED screen. We've got this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, well, but you still don't run as well as an iPhone because you're not optimized. The, the, the OS isn't optimized. Not to mention, they customize the crap out of it to make it look different than the other manufacturers, which makes it in turn run worse. So, and look, I had so many Android phones and I used to be the epitome of an Android guy that hated on iPhones, even though I had tons of Apple products and I was rooting my phones and I was updating them all the time on different modded OSs, and I can just tell you, when you stop using Android, everything just starts working. Sorry, Mike, but that's bullshit. Android had features way before Apple did. Now, here's the chicken and the egg comment, Delta 2 X-Ray. Here's the chicken and the egg comment, and you're acting like Android invented the mobile phone. Everything was stolen from something else, period. What are you not? You're not going to take part in this one, Kurt? No, I'm letting you go off on this. This, this is my good for it. I mean, really, this is this literally is the chicken and the egg comment. Yeah, Android had X feature before Apple did. Well, guess what? When Apple released it, it actually worked, as opposed to being a half baked entry because Google threw it in so quickly. Uh, um, I'll 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 agree with you that uh, because Apple. Uh, developing for themselves, then obviously they can optimize for themselves and for the singular product. Um, but this is where I was saying about things being a bit more subjective. Um, is that I was saying I've I find Android to be fine, but that's because I've just never had a problem with it. Whereas well, you obviously there have. Is, you're right. There, someone just chimed in in the chat and they told us about this new feature that everybody should hear about. Uh, Samsung innovated it. It's called the exploding feature. It's where your phone <laughs> literally explodes. <laughs> and I can promise you. Well, I can't promise. Wait a minute. Apple. Didn't, what? Didn't an iPod. Was it? I mean, it was an iPhone or an iPod uh, was reported. This sounds speculative. Uh, if you don't pull up some sources, you're just talking out of your ass. I'll have a hunt. I'm sure there was one of the two was uh, exploding. All well, over I can tell you one yeah. thing. Apple didn't have a mass recall and recall all of their products because they exploded on more than one occasion. And uh, well, my, my advice to that person is put that phone in his pants. Yeah, I mean, I, I know somebody <laughs> who will not return their Note 7. And you want to know why? Because they don't believe it's going to happen to them. And you know what? They might be right because there is, I don't know, how many hundreds of thousands of phones sold and only a few of them have exploded. But the problem is so bad that Samsung actually released a software update that would only allow the phone to be charged up to 60% because any more than that, it can explode. That in itself violates Google's development terms of services. 
Therefore, they shouldn't even be doing that. But you can't force people to return something that they bought. So anybody that has also, one is playing isn't this, Sorry, isn't this uh, going off the, t the subject of uh, iOS and Android, though, because it's actually the hardware. It's not the... It's not the operating system. Well, I'm sorry, but Samsung does not release phones with anything but Android on them. Therefore, they are a 100% <laughs> representative of Android as a whole. That's and funny. because they have to modify Android itself to limit the battery capacity, this is an Android problem. Because if their customized version of it, which it is, they use TouchWiz or whatever the name of their latest cover software is, if it's TouchWiz that's blowing up the phone or if it's TouchWiz that it has to be used to limit the phone, it's still an OS level thing. It's The hardware is blowing up, but the hardware doesn't blow up when it's turned off, right? I don't know, because it might do when it's charged. I don't know, because I don't have one. You're an Android guy. This is your fault. Okay. I'm just kidding. Anyway, iPhone <laughs> 7 uh, sold out everywhere. Uh, actually, this was a botched release again by Apple. I just don't know if they choose to not realize how big they are or they choose to ignore the fact that they sell as many phones as they do on an annual basis. But their midnight their midnight pre-sale was completely fucked. And I was a victim of that. Um, pretty much no matter where you were in the country, the second you got into the pre-launch, uh, iPhone 7 Pluses were gone everywhere. And I mean everywhere. And if you checked on the phone app and the computer app, it would tell you different stocks. And then at the end of the day, it didn't matter for everyone because <laughs> when people showed up on launch day, almost everyone was turned away at every store. Verizon, AT&T, Apple, T-Mobile. They turned everybody away that wanted an iPhone 7 Plus, which is crazy to me because they've had these Plus models out for two generations now. And they've seen the amount of units they do. And for them to not have any stock is absolutely out of control. I mean, that is insane. And uh, so I got fucked on launch night, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I've now waited almost five days for my phone. Tough. Life is tough. I'm way behind. Life is tough when you gotta, you're got you sweating over five days on a cell phone. Well, what I was mostly worried about was having a waterproof phone at my bachelor party, which is next week. But I'm now going to have... You guys don't know what it's like to be in Manhattan in an old phone booth when you, you're. I've been in a phone booth you in Manhattan. You needed a you needed a coin to dial up, which wasn't hard. The worst part was the fact that the phone booth smelt like a fucking toilet, because in Manhattan most people used the phone booths as piss boots. So, but that's a whole experience. We we had that when I was growing up. Piss boots. Yeah. <laughs> they have them now. They actually oh. turned a lot of old uh, has, phone booths into Vince gone, public restrooms in Manhattan, didn't they, Vince? The ones you have to pay to use. Uh, Vince is muted. Vince, you're muted. <laughs> we cannot hear you. Hello, Vince. You are Sorry still that. muted. Uh, damn cat again. Unplug the headphone and plug it back in if you have to. Maybe you try turning it off and turn it back Maybe on. Maybe Kurt can sing us a British lullaby while we wait for Vince. Hello? We can oh, hear we you now. Now you don't have to you sing. Save the stream for me singing. Kurt was going to sing a British lullaby while you were muted. No, it's. Uh, I really wasn't. The so controller anyway, just keeps, keeps dropping. We're going to talk about one of the uh, hot button topics for the iPhone 7. And this is good because we have our sound guy here. Uh, the removal of the headphone jack, which I see uh, John Merchant likes to just post and post about in our little chat here. Uh, personally, it doesn't affect me at all. I use Bluetooth headphones. I have for years, and I'm not going to stop anytime soon. The phones are flying off the shelves. It clearly isn't pissing that many people off. Your opinion, Kurt? I put, well, I think it's... I can see how it's an annoying thing for them to do to for a lot of people, but the thing is, there is a workaround. People, well, they, and they're giving it to or, you for free. Hmm? And they've given it to you for free. They gave an I don't adapter. Know about that, to be they gave a Have headphone they? jack to Lightning adapter, which it solves one problem and it creates another because that means when you are listening to music, you can't charge, and it does not come with a dual Lightning adapter in the box. So it does create a small problem for no. It only comes with. 
a Lightning 2 headphone jack adapter. That's it. So if you're someone that commutes to work, let's say you have to ride the Long Island Railroad into Manhattan every day, and you're on an hour and a half train ride, you cannot charge your phone while you're listening to music unless you have wireless headphones. So it, like I said, it creates a small problem for some, but I, I think this is such a small problem. And in my opinion, this had to be done at some point. Like this was going to happen. And there are there ha, there have been a few Android phones that have come out without headphone jacks, but they're usually lower end ones. And I believe the uh, original, maybe GBA or one one of the Nintendo handheld systems didn't have a headphone jack on it as well. So this has been done, but it hasn't been done in a major enough fashion that it can actually advance mobile sound. And I think this is this may be the way. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a big flop, and they'll put the headphone jack back in in the next phone. I, I don't know. Kurt? Mm, what? <laughs> I, I really don't know, but um, the, um, well, the popularity of people listening to music or whatever on, on their phones has made, or, or even iPods, MP3 players, and on their computers in general, it's actually um, made uh, things get worse uh, in general, to be fair, because people have been wanting to have uh, things encoded into smaller files so that they can fit more onto the uh, hard drives and all this, especially back when this was first becoming popular with MP3s. Um, but like with iTunes, they have their own compression for all of the music that's on there. And it's basically just gotten a lot of people used to the sound of worse quality music. And um, to be fair, most people wouldn't ever notice it unless you are someone who really pays attention to it but then those people are the kind of people that still buy vinyl do you only listen and, to flawless on your on your media uh no to be honest um usually when i listen to music um it's only for a short amount of time so i just quickly pop something on usually i actually listen to something through youtube oh to so be you're, honest. Part, you're part of the problem is what we're saying uh, <laughs> so. yeah i am to a degree, uh, but I am also one of the few that still buys uh, albums, like physical albums. I have a, a CD collection that's 800 to 1,000 albums strong. Um, I, I've not been buying vinyl of recent because I haven't got a, a record player set up. Do you think CDs to are going to be worth what vinyl is? Uh, no. No. I don't think so. The thing is, vinyl's coming back. It's already making another revival. Yeah, I, I know. Um, well, it's with the rise of the DJ, as if you will, a lot more vinyl has been made available. So if you look into the electronic scene, most singles and albums that big DJs drop, they also drop them in vinyl so that other DJs can play that vinyl. And I'm sure that has moved out into the metal industry and rock and roll. Well, I think that has affected it to a degree, but I don't know how much, to be honest. Uh, the the, um, the dance and techno and all that side of it um, definitely did help for a certain part because when uh, all that music and DJs in general started getting really popular, something on probably about 10 to 15 years ago or longer, uh, you then got up the kind of dance record stores, independent record stores dealing with all these vinyl um, but then, as technology grew, you got more DJs actually using MP3 decks. Well, and that seems to be it's, what a lot of people are it's using become in more of a and show, and the shows themselves need to be slight, a slightly more flawless. B, why risk it if you're getting paid fifty to a hundred grand to do a set every single night and pump up the crowd? Why would you risk actually live mixing vinyl when you can? either set up the whole set on on an mp3 <laughs> on an mp3 uh, or or you know right. act, or just live mix mp3s i mean it if i'm it, you know i'm looking at it like the super bowl does this was made known actually i believe two years ago when they proved that the red hot chili peppers had guitars that were not plugged into anything and they were accused of faking it and then they came out with a statement the next day that said We've never faked a show in our lives. When we were asked to play the Super Bowl, we were told this is how it's done. They don't allow for anything else. It's too big of a show with too many variables. The, this is the way we have to do it. So it came out that basically only the singing is done live. The guitars are not. And 
I mean, in my head, I'm like, why didn't they even plug a fucking wireless system into their <laughs> guitars to make it look like they were playing something? But you know, th these are big. These are big events now, and um, you don't want to piss off people that are paying a lot of money to watch. And it might take some of the purity out of it. I'm sure, a, you know, a purist or you know, someone that is just such a hardcore musician that they can't stand the idea of faking it. But to me, it's like it's business. It's a show, and uh, the easier Actually, way. I have a good example of that. What's that? Um, not to the same scale as like the Super Bowl, but uh, do you guys know of Top of the Pops in mm -hmm. Britain? Mm -hmm. um, Top of the Pops. This is going back a long time, um, but I say a long time, probably about two decades. Uh, we used to have a weekly show called Top of the Pops, which showed you uh, music on the charts for that week. So what what was going up to be number one and all this. And they would have people coming to perform perform on the show. And what it would be, uh, I think they changed it to the, uh, in the last couple of years, but for the 20 to 30 years that it was originally running, um, they wouldn't let anyone play live. It would only be the vocals done. Actually, I think for a lot of times, they wouldn't even let the vocals be live. And the people had to pantomime. But um, Nirvana went on to do Smells Like Teen Spirit and when they got told they had to fake it, Kurt Cobain was like, "I ain't gonna fucking do that. I'll, I'll, um, I'll take the piss out of your show for if you make me do this. No, you do that. You won't be invited back." <laughs> so he goes, "Okay, okay, we'll we'll do it your way." Went out on stage, and there's footage of it. If you see, they're completely um, just... fucking around. Well, yeah. no, it's um, Kurt is uh, literally doing this with his guitar. Uh, <laughs> Chris was swinging his bass around and uh, Dave was just kicking around his drums. Kurt was actually singing, but he did it in like an opera style. <laughs> and they cut it off halfway through the performance. <laughs> well, uh, that's that's one way to take care of this problem. But uh... <laughs> All right, let's move on from this topic. We've yeah. talked about this garbage for long enough. I think maybe it's time to answer a few questions that we have from the fans in the chat. So... <sighs> useless i'm a bit curious about some things regarding character development what was the thought process behind creating the postal dude as a character i'm particularly interested in the decisions behind his deadpan humor physical appearance clothing and his mild temperament such as his chill nature despite his psychotic endeavors is he actually insane demented desensitized etc i don't know wow. vince <laughs> you were there <laughs> you were there when the Jesus. dude was originally developed you might be the dude for all we know why don't oh, you answer this God. fucking paragraph of a question that was a lot um basically <laughs> to try to and this kind of goes back to even postal redo now and the original postal was done in such a style where the characters were not terribly important as much as it was the gameplay to just be able to relentlessly be a shooter um when we were developing the characters and you know the the postal dude uh the postal I, I i'm not even so sure that the postal dude the moniker came out in the early beginning because the whole idea was that he was just this person that was kind of living in this small town called paradise and you know he was dressed in that certain way because back then this was in the mid 90s and the whole black trench coat look was quite popular for people that were, how would I say, not necessarily loners, but, uh, okay. you, you know, they, they were just out there doing their own thing. Uh, and, and then, you know, there was a very, very early sketch where the postal worker was on and actually was a postal worker on a postal Jeep, if you remember that. I think we even publicized it at one time. But... As far as his sanity goes, I think it's relative. I mean, if, you know, here in America, we have more and more cases, depending upon if the press promotes it or releases it, where, you know, somebody comes in your home and they attempt to, you know, kill your children or rape your wife and you kill them. It's pretty basic. Like, I don't have a problem with that. However, um, the storyline we created was that, his home was being surrounded and we came up with some storyline that the house was being repossessed by the banks. But really it was just 
beautiful. I mean, the way I think of it is it was beautiful hand painted backgrounds with these tiny little characters. So the insanity factor, I never really thought of it so much as being insane. When we got to the very last level, uh, something that was misrepresented in several newspapers, particularly the Wall Street Journal, they referenced that we allow you to kill children, which is what, as you know, Jay and Kurt, um, I've always been very big about one thing. Whatever we do, I've always considered kids to be off limits. And in the very last level, you know, you go through this series of trying to use weapons and none of them are working because the idea is that we're not going to allow you to do you know, to do this. And then you go into the whole um, asylum mode and et cetera, et cetera. It was just a fun ending at that point that we created. Um, I mean, think about it. How many people go, you know, see shrinks or go to an asylum and they're back on the street or whatever. So it's all very, I, I don't like to ever make anything finite. So to try to, I hope that some of my uh, verbage has answered this paragraph of a question. Um, it's, it's the postal dudes really you and me. The postal dude is everyone. The postal dude is Brexit. The postal dude is is going to elect Donald Trump. I mean, it's, you know, not to get political, but the postal dude is really the everyday person. So not I to get political, to... but let's move on. <laughs> uh, who was the painkiller in uh, Postal One's credits? I have no idea, Vince. Who was it? Oh, God, the painkiller. I believe it was Bill Kunkel. God rest his soul. That's there what he wanted to be. Yeah. Godfather. Truly the godfather of gaming journalism. Uh, for those that are listening, Bill, along with a, another gentleman, Arnie Katz, they co-founded Electronic Games Magazine, I think in it was 78, uh, 1978, when that magazine, that was the first magazine that was 100% devoted to the video game industry. Uh, prior to that, there were people were writing about, you know, Atari and games, but it was the very first magazine, 100% devoted. And then Bill Bill Kunkel, um, later, I mean, he's a friend of mine, and he was there from the very beginning of Running with Scissors. And uh, you know, God rest his soul, Bill, wherever you are listening or paying attention, Bill never was one to, you know, seek credit. Um, and he didn't want to at that time. Um, he couldn't use his name, which was the game doctor. That's something that he was also known as. Uh, he would write his editorials as the game doctor. But at that time, because of certain uh, restrictions or whom he was working with, other companies, etc. So he came up with he wanted to be known as the painkiller. So well, that was it. rest in peace, Bill Kunkel. I remember you well. Uh, yeah. Next question. We're not going to answer, but it is, uh, when should we expect Postal 4? The answer is, go fuck yourself. Next question. <laughs> Hypothetically, in a circumstance in which you could do a crossover between Postal and some other franchise, what would it be? Kurt, go. What? <laughs> what Postal and listening? some other franchise. Ooh, if you could do a crossover know. between Postal and something else, and then don't go with the obvious hatred or something like that. Let's do a real crossover. For me, it's simple. It, it's Super Mario. I mean, See, that, that's what popped into my head, actually, was uh, Super yeah. Mario. I it's think fun. Conkers would be a better crossover. Conkers? You never played Bad Fur Day, Kurt? Uh, it brings a bell, but I don't think I ever played it. It was a game on the N64... Sega that was all little, you know, bears and shit. Like, it looked like the um, characters on Splash Mountain on in Disneyland. But uh, they all cussed and pissed on things. And it was ridiculous for the time, actually. And it was on Nintendo, which is even crazier. So, uh, I don't know. I just think that would be a natural crossover for the dude. Mm. Anyway, next question. This Vince can answer. Okay. What gave you guys the idea to name yourselves Running With Scissors? Well, that was another simple, easy one. Basically, 
back then, I can't even remember the names of so many game developers, but in my opinion, they were really boring. Um, just sci-fi driven, whatever. I, I don't like shit like that. And the fact that we came at, you know, we knew we were making a game that was going to be very different. And because our prior history was making games for edutainment or educational games, I really wanted it to be a, a name that was a moniker that in itself would create uh, a certain, uh, you know, suggestive thought process. And actually, because we were, we were at that time, long, this is so long ago, that was like being the bad boys of the video game industry. We were the black, eventually became obviously the scapegoat and the black sheep of the video game industry, and even that last to this day. But early on, when I was growing up in the 50s, and I'm sure you guys have heard this, you know, there was a whole expression, which was, you know, your mother always told you, don't run with scissors. It's like the one thing you don't do. You don't run with scissors when you're growing up. So my feeling was, well, we're everything your mother told you not to do. Okay, we, we want to be the opposite of that. So it was really just, it just came out and it was like, run with, we were playing around with run with scissors and, and then it was just, now it's, it's where we are running with scissors and that's it. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm actually going to segue into another topic directly from what we just answered, which was how did you come up with the name and what does it represent? And recently there has been a major controversy on Steam over a company that is called Digital Homicide. And uh, I'm gonna let Kurt talk about this one. So uh, go for it, buddy. Yeah. I, I, I think I might know the most about it, but I don't know hugely in depth. But yeah, Digital Homicide, uh, they have recently had caused a bit of a ruckus because uh, Jim Sterling, the games reviewer, uh, mostly known now for his YouTube um, series, Jimquisition, he slated uh he slated i think i can't remember if it was one of their games or a whole bunch of their games but basically he pointed out that they were all shit um and put them down uh quite vehemently well they and, were supposedly releasing games under different labels too yeah um so yeah he he gave this review um, which wasn't exactly nice, shall we say? <laughs> hey, listen, so they, got, they decided to sue zero. them. So I, I, I find this whole topic, and please go on, Kurt. But to me, if you're in any type of entertainment, you've got thin skin. You don't belong in this business. No, I mean, nobody. Th there's no game on earth, not even Mario, which I happen to be love. I mean, they're just not everybody likes Call of Duty. Not. I mean, it's just. Jesus Christ! And yeah, so but somebody, the, these guys are more like these guys are more like Ed Wood or Uva Bowl. They like literally release crap and then they yeah. change their well, company name but, so that they can and, release and, more crap. Yeah, but the thing the the topic that um, Mike is bringing up at the moment is Jim Sterling gave them this horrible review, and so they decided to sue him it's because they. They reckon that it was uh, an assault, uh, that they lost sales because of it. Um, so they sued him for that. And what the reason why it's uh, come up more in the news dollars, now. $15 by the way. They sued him for $15 million. Yeah. 15 Which is still, million. it's actually still going on at the moment. But the reason why it's in the press at the moment is they sent, I can't remember the word, but they subpoena, sent. Subpoena. Subpoena, that's it. To Valve because they reckon that from this review, at least a hundred people then went on to give bad reviews of their games on Steam, and they even reckon that it went to the extent of they were sending uh, horrible emails and things like that. So they sent the subpoena to Valve asking for the personal information of these hundred people so that they could sue them as well. And Valve's <laughs> response has been to take all their games off of Steam. Good for them. Why would yeah. they? If you're going to sue your game publisher... They're going to remove your games, yeah. especially when you're trying to get private users' information so that you can Listen, sue this is, the users. This is not a constitutional right or a parliamentary right. 
Um, and then, Jay, you had told me that these guys or whomever they are, they're based in Yuma, Arizona. Mm. Running with Scissors is based in Tucson, Arizona. I mean, Arizona, one of the things I was attracted to it is it's a very free, independent oriented you know, type state, you know, do what you want to do, wear guns, shoot, whatever you want to, it, it's, it's open. And I, I'm just, I can't stand the whole lawsuit industry. I mean, this to me is so absurd. And um, whomever this individual is that's being sued, I mean, th there will be no shortage of video game developers, veterans like us who would gladly, um, testify as a you know professional expert witness if you will i mean we have been I, I don't really know another company more so than running with scissors that has gotten beaten up in the press the game press the mainstream press tv fucking youtube you name it nobody has gotten beaten up worse than us and Fuck, it's okay. we wear it as a badge we put that well, shit the, listen, on our game it's okay box. My only beef has always been when somebody writes or says something about us that is inaccurate, okay? But that's that's more to do with know our games before you criticize us. But if you want to say our games suck because we have the worst load t times in history, they were pretty bad. If you want to say things that are opinion, it's opinion. It's just the way it's okay. I mean... I, I, I find, you know, Jay just told me about this the other day. I was like, you got to be fucking, I mean, I'm, I haven't been online for a week. I've been, I, you know, I'm, I'm been outside of civilization, um, which is really a nice thing, but I, I couldn't believe it when he was telling me this, I was like, mm. what do they, and these people are going to lose everything, any potential future they have where they might make a better game or create a new studio. Nobody, be it becomes toxic. You know, who wants to be associated with people? I, I, I mean, look, I'm pro developer all the way. I mean, way big time. But in this particular case, I think this development group is really kind of. It's, <laughs> it's basically That's... spawned the catchphrase uh, that people like to say <laughs> now of a uh, digital homicide they, of committed digital they... suicide. Yeah, yes. Well, it's. I think it should be called. Yeah, it's, what'd you say? It was digital homicide or digital suicide? Jay? Digital, yeah, homicide digital homicide is a company, but he said digital homicide has created dig, or has Absolute, committed digital Kurt, suicide. Perfect, Kurt. Said it. That's the summary. Let's move on to another topic. This, 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 this is a toilet topic. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> let me. Uh, oh my fucking mouse stopped working. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I gotta get up. Some Any other fan here. questions or inquiries? Or yeah, I do. I just systems. Oh, my stupid mouse! I think it died. I need to get my next. cord. Do you want me to ask the next question? You might as well. Next question is: Is the dude's hair natural red or dyed? He is truly I I a never, ginger. I, I never. <laughs> to me, you know, when he started, it was it, he had dark hair. And then somehow it got lighter, and then red hair, and then Zach Ward's a natural ginger. He played the postal dude. He's the always had red hair. You just didn't and, pay attention. And then the yeah, I know, like I wasn't there. And then the Russians made him even more ruski red. Uh, but I don't. Who cares? I mean, you know, it's like I do. Know, He's a ginger. Yeah. That's He's what gingers ginger. do. <laughs> That's we're ginger. we're making a statement <laughs> on gingerhood. That's what they do. <laughs> Stay away. Gingers, gingers go postal. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, now for a real question that we don't really have an answer to either, but people are asking, what about the new TV series that I happened to mention on the Frank show a couple months ago? No news, nothing to discuss. It's something we are actively pursuing, but uh, nothing to talk about right now. So, you know. Stay tuned. Stay, Stay tuned. tuned and email your favorite video producer and your network radio station executives and tell them you want Postal on TV. So uh, anyway, next question. What is the reasoning behind the sudden Postal 2 patch with Steam jokes? Uh, well, the reason is that... Sudden. <laughs> The reason is that back in 2002, when we were developing the game, we didn't have the assets or ability to fill up every store in the mall, and so some of them were closed. 
and one of them said uh, closed for renovations until June of 2016. Now, the guys back then, I'm not sure who did the level. I would assume it was Brian Dillo. But just put an arbitrary date in the future, and he clearly didn't think far enough ahead because in his mind and probably all of our minds, uh, <laughs> the, game it was far enough. the game wouldn't be anywhere near relevant in 2016, let alone updated again. You know, it might make a chuckle to somebody who happened to purchase the game that many years after its release, but we noticed it. Uh, it was all over Reddit. Um, it, it was a big deal before it even before we updated it, and we had been talk, talking for a while about updating it, and then we finally decided to do it, and we threw it together pretty quickly. I believe a lot of the work was done by our... Uh, <clears throat> Our new Russian, his name is Eric, and uh, he did a great job. We got we got VR in there. We got to pick fun at some more modern topics in our old ass game, and uh, I got to warn everybody to don't buy Postal Three over and over and over. And what's funny about it is we put it out, we kind of announced it, and it didn't really get much traction other than the obvious people who knew about it. But uh, Kotaku picked it up a few weeks ago. And Kodaku. It, Kodaku. And it uh, made made quite a bit of news recently. So we're, we're happy that we could throw that out there and give people some laughs. Because uh, it's pretty funny. It's small. It's insignificant. But, you know, it's just like everything else we do. We like to keep even our old shit kind of updated. Fresh. And, and, and kept fresh. And especially when we give you the, the long joke, you know, the long joke, which is... 2016. You know, we could have as simply have put both of those. There's two stores actually that said opening in June 2016. Obviously, because we were trying to save overhead on assets because we didn't want to make another sign that said a different date. But uh, you know, the other store now says uh, June 2029, I believe. So let's see where we're at in third in another 13 years, and maybe we can update it then. If you guys keep buying it, we'll keep updating it. So uh, tell your friends. Uh, what are your guys' favorite type of games? FPS, RPG, etc. Uh, personally, I've always been an FPS guy. I kind of lived and died on Counter-Strike back in the dorms. I actually failed out of college the first time because of Counter-Strike. Uh, I always played GoldenEye when I was a kid. But other than FPS, it's been sports games. I played a lot of uh, Ken Griffey's Major League Baseball, um, NBA Jam, uh, in the NHL series, those those are my those are my shits. What about you, Kurt? Um, well, getting away from like uh, growing up, it was all my like um, side scrollers and all that. But when things started to expand a bit more, I was more into FPSs. But it was more it was like um, I got into Call of Duty when Black Ops came out, um, and I really like I still really like the Left 4 Dead series. But these days, I. I don't know anything that's got kind of an atmosphere to it. Like um, over on my YouTube channel, I'm, uh, two of the games I'm playing are a new one called Event Zero, which is uh, set in space. It's all first person sp uh, perspective, but it is just this huge atmosphere of being completely alone. And all you've got is a computer AI to try and help you survive and get back. Um, but there's also a, a, a pixelated game, a side scroll and pixelated game called The Final Station which again is like a post-apocalyptic zombie thing, but it uh, again has the whole um, atmosphere of being alone and just trying to survive. That kind of thing I like, just something that kind of makes you get really deep into it. Um, aside from that, is uh, one of my favourite games that I'm starting to play again now is the Sniper Elite series. So that's going back to kind of FPSs again in a way, mm -hmm. I guess. What about you, Vinny? For me, it's real simple. Video games you know, fast. I, I like puzzles. I play puzzles more than anything. And I go Bubble back to blaster. The old, I go, I go back to, yeah, well, I'm on planes all the time. And I go back to the old early arcade days where, you know, you didn't get to play a game for that long. I mean, you, you basically, you know, your quarter only lasted so long. <laughs> and so my whole uh, philosophy towards gaming has always been, and I learned this when I was working with the original Atari. And it's that old simple saying that um, easy, easy to learn, hard to master. And so for me, games have always been something you play. You should play because you're having fun. And somebody wins, somebody loses. And it's a, I, I like rep repetition and addiction 
So I, for me, that's why puzzle games has always worked. I've, you know, first person shooters were made, made me sick back in the doom days. I think I had, it. I mean, I could remember that and, um, which when we actually decided to make Postal, I was very happy, the original Postal, I was very happy with the uh, three quarter isometric view, if you will, because it just was, I don't know, just, I, and again, I mean, well, you know, one thing if we could just say, uh, if I could say here, while well, you have folks listening, I, w I fell madly in love with the hand painted backgrounds of the original Postal. That was something that wasn't, I mean, it, it cost us in so many ways but especially with the recent postal redo, the great work that the, that the, all the current members of Running with Scissors put together into that and made that that was a real effort of love, if you will. I mean, that's that's a, a very tedious process. But I'd like to just know what fans think about the hand painted backgrounds. Um, for me, it's something that was always special about postal. I, I loved it, and I and I, I still do. But yeah, anyway, in terms of game playing, at that end, I mean, this will really take me back in history, pole position. I used to love driving games, arcade driving games, but I had not anymore. I just, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, I hate to admit it, but I play games on my phone. <laughs> well, yeah. so. everybody does nowadays. It's the biggest form of gaming. Let's move on. Uh Got a few more questions here. Let's cap it here, March, and these are the last three questions. Do you guys prefer the darker style of Postal 1 or the more humorous style of Postal 2? Personally, wow. they love the darker side. Uh, I can say that the more humorous style is what I like. It's better for development, it's more fun for the recording studio, and I think it actually allows for a bigger uh, audience. So, Kurt? Yeah, I kind of agree. I think the the more humorous version is probably my uh, preferred, but there's it's so close together. I like them both for the fact that they are completely opposite, so it's for opposite reasons. Um, I would actually... Uh, I, I get very interested in uh, more kind of darker things because I think there's uh, a lot of area that you can explore and gives you um, a, a lot of scope. But um, obviously the humorous side of it it adds the entertainment and the laughs and all the rest of it. So, but yeah, I think the humorous one's probably my favorite of the two. Well, for me, I this might sound a little strange to some folks, but I actually found the original Postal to be quite humorous. When I suggested to the team that we have fire and let's set people on fire, I was laughing my ass off when, you know, we would, I used to have, back, back in that day, my office was quite large. That was, I mean, my personal office. And we would have meetings in my personal office because it was just the structure of the, the building. And I just love the, con I love, I grew up with fire. I set a lot of things on fire when I was a kid. So, you know, and we're having these brainstorming, brainstorming creative sessions. So for me, Postal One, while it has a certain dark, eerie, feeling and i give that credit to randy briley who um was our very first art director unbelievably talented guy and he's the one that honed that particular style that art that that art style is to randy's credit um but there's so many little funny things in in, in postal one you know, there's the site where there's the construction site and there's the outhouse. And if you go up to it, you hear somebody taking a dump. I mean, this to me is funny humor. Having the um, the animals, the ostriches, you know, fucking shooting and killing all these. I laughed my ass off. You yeah, know, but that's I mean, a one-off. These are one-off things. Well, it, but it's also take the parade. To me, I said, let's – because my whole idea was I said, look, I want to kill a lot of people at the same time, but I want to I want to set them all on fire. How could we do a group session? I was like, you know, how many you know, how many characters could we get? And people were like, well, this, we could do that. And I said, look, what about a marching band? Let's fucking put the marching band in there and set the whole fucking marching band on fire. Watching those trombones flying around. I love that shit. So to me, Postal One actually had a lot of humor. I get it. It's darker humor than most people might feel comfortable with or be attracted to. But, you know, kind of segueing into Postal Two, 
I love the humor in Postal too. I mean, to me, you know, the whole thing, uh, when, when people back, when Postal 2 first came out and people would send clips, you know, when they would chop someone's head off and then there was this, this whole period, I don't know if you remember, Jay, where people's heads were being used like bowling balls. It was phenomenal. I loved it. I mean, this is a certain type of humor that, you know, obviously we, I don't profess or condone this in real life. I never did. My thing has always been give people an opportunity in video games, in the alternate reality of video games to fucking, to, to piss their, piss themselves or do anything you want. The whole idea was, you know, if you're going to be violent, be violent in, in a, in a fantasy world, don't take it out in the, in the real world. And that's something we've always been big fans of. But so for me, I've always seen the humor in in both of them. So, well, you say about the uh, the the funny side of the setting the marching band on fire. That is still something that is seen widely through everyone. Like when we did uh, when we were at EGX Res earlier in the year, when people were playing it, we'd actually say to them, right, save that Molotov, start of the level, right now, do this, and every single one of them would piss themselves every Th single time. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. You well, know, in that case, just... Postal One's funnier than Postal Two. <laughs> well, let me let me just give you guys one small example. When the original Postal came out in, I believe it was nine. We formed the company in ninety six. I think it came out in November ninety seven. But we attended E three, and at that time, I think it was only the second or third E three. Um, they had been in Los, it was Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and this E3 was in Atlanta, Georgia. And we had a whole big booth that, you know, Panasonic was our publisher behind the scenes. And we might have had 20 monitors. It was a, it was a, a wall of monitors. So you could, and we had this contest going on. But you could imagine when you had 20 monitors and you had the marching band come on. Or a 20 monitor display. This was, I, I don't even know how tall it was, maybe 15 feet tall or whatever that is, five meters or seven meters by seven meters. I, I kid you not, when the marching band came on, we, we would have hit the show. I mean, every, you know, we were across the street from CNN's uh, news office. I mean, we were being, everybody was coming to the booth because they were just like, what are you doing? And I was like, I didn't have to say anything because nobody could hold back. They were, what, this was like, this is the most insane fucking thing I've ever seen. You're setting a marching band on fire and everybody's laughing. And I was like, thank you. That meant I felt so good. I, 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 I mean, I just remember it so well. I, I was so proud, but so happy because I said to myself, we did it. This is what I wanted. I wanted people to laugh at violence. That was part of my whole early motivation. And watching that, like you just said, Kurt, at the last show you guys did in London, that's it. You know, that's living proof. You know, when you stick something, when you show it there, and how does the audience respond? Boom. You know? So, next question, if there's another question. But oh, yeah, there is questions. <clears throat> How did we find such a perfect voice actor for the dude? Well, um, Christian, Christian Slayer, who was Sally our sound or person. Sally. Sally or Slayer, whatever. Anyway, good guy. He was... Um, our sound guy back then. And he was, he did sound on some of our earlier educational games for kids. And he, there's a gentleman named, well, you, you know, Rick so well, and he works in the radio industry locally in Tucson. And so we were very fortunate um, to make that connection. He's actually a national voice actor. Yeah. He is the top voice actor for what is now known as, I Heart Media, which was uh, Clear Channel. He does all the Clear Channel voiceovers around. Great the voice. Anyway, the last question. Any news on a boxed copy of Postal Redux Paradise Lost? Uh, that will be addressed in the 20th anniversary. That's all I have to say about that. And with that, we'll move on to our actual final topic of the, uh, <clears throat> of the podcast. 
And that is any uh, type of media that you've seen lately. Movies, TV shows, books, books on tape. Uh, I know Vince has something to rant about, so take it away, VD. Well, it's not so much a rant. I went to see Ben-Hur, uh, which is a remake of the... Actually, people don't realize this. They were, it's a remake of a remake. The one that was most popular was around 1960 with the infamous Charlton Heston. Uh, and it was a phenomenal film back then. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, but the one that just came out was just a horrible piece of shit. I mean, I actually, look, I like the Postal movie. I don't think it's as bad as it got hammered, but I also know that it, there was a lot, of, a lot of areas for improvement. I kid you not, I left the theater saying, Uwe Ball deserves an Oscar compared to this Ben-Hur piece of shit. I'll just give you a quick summary for people that are into film. It opens, uh, the cinematography is nice, but the script is fucking retarded. They say things like amazing, okay? So the, the script was retarded. The acting was, when I take a dump, I, my ass is a better actor than anybody in the movie. That's how bad this fucking movie was. And I happen <laughs> to like the Kurtz of Brit. I love, I love a lot of the Brits. But, and look, you guys have great famous actors. I mean, my God. But they're all the movie actors, villains. They're all the, 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 movie it does, villains. It doesn't matter. But Alec Guinness was not Michael a Caine. was was not a movie villain. But you have in this movie Ben Hur these this young cast, and they're talking in a British accent. Like, not, I mean, it's just like I might as well be watching some fucking you 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 know Victorian show. It was really horrible. So you got the script, you got the acting, the editing was like enough already, and then to completely take it away. They change the fucking ending and they give it a complete Hollywood happy ending. Whereas in the real Ben-Hur, the bad guy basically dies. Here, they fucking... It reminded don't me of the... Don't spoil a terrible movie for everyone. Well, I, mean, I don't want anybody to spend money on this. <laughs> it reminded me of the ending in, in the Postal movie when you've got bin, uh, Bush and Bin Laden, you know, dancing happily off into the sunset. That's the fucking ending of ben -Hur. I'm telling you. This and even the the chariot scene, which is obviously the most famous scene, okay, even that was fucking weak. I mean, you want to see a great chariot scene? Go see the original movie. But I, I, I wish I, I I hate to say it because I like movies. I go to movies a lot, and it kills me when something is done so poorly. And they got that poor guy. What's his name? He's he's in every movie. He's a, an elderly uh, actor. Oh my ben god. Kingsley? Um. Sorry, who? Ben Kingsley. No, ben, I like Ben Kingsley. Ben Kingsley's a good guy. He was no, until like, he did an Uva Bowl movie. He's a he's a, a a black actor. What's his name, Jay? He's the fucking guy. He's in everything. They got him in fucking in, in these dreadlocks that are. Oh, of, you're talking about. Uh, he's the voice. He's the voice of everything. Come on, he was God. He plays God. He's in every. He's Morgan in every. Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Yeah, yeah. The guy, I mean, look, I didn't think the guy needed a paycheck, but I, I am sure if you could get him on a few drinks, he would admit it's probably the worst movie he's ever been in. I mean, he's a great actor. I can't, I mean, the guy. I'm should, sure he I, also he, would tell you he, he doesn't a give a fuck because he of the a lawsuit. He should sue the movie company for the end result that he was in. That's what is he going to sue him for more than he made for the movie? He probably oh, made five million dollars. Who? What does he care? Well, I don't know. Horrible, horrible movie. But anyway, that's my two cents. How many dicks do you give it? None. I, I It doesn't even qualify for, as a dildo. That's how fucking I thought bad you were going to give it a baby dick. Uh, I just changed my mind. It's gone down. Nothing. It's Nothing. smaller than a baby dick. Not worth, not, not worth circumcising. That, I mean, it was. it's probably the worst movie I could remember in the last 10 years. That's how bad it was. Well. So. That's pretty bad. What about you, Kurt? What have you seen or heard or read lately? You got an album you like? Do you have a movie you've seen? Have you watched a good to be porn? Honest, uh, uh, no, I've seen all the porn before. Um, to be honest, I haven't been able to consume a lot of stuff at the moment because we've moved house. So like sorting out the new house, um, work, doing YouTube, and uh, the family in general that's right you're not I'm allowed gonna... to watch anything you're on you're on restriction because we got to work on our new game no media exactly. for you exactly um 
but yeah, I've, I've played a couple of games which I've already spoke about, but um, I told uh, Mike this earlier. I started reading a book when we moved in here a couple of weeks ago called I Am, I Am a Cat, which is a Japanese book. Uh, but I've got six pages in and I haven't had a chance to pick it up again for two weeks. Um, the only other thing I recently saw was uh, a group of Italian filmmakers uh, recently put out a self-made Left for Dead film. And uh, it's like 45, 50 minutes long, something like that. Um, it's not bad, actually. They've had absolutely no budget. Obviously, there's no licensing behind it or anything. So you've got to... You've got to uh, t- watch it with a grain of salt. I'll take it with a grain of salt. But um, it's all right. The problem they have with it is it doesn't really go... It doesn't like have a story arc like most films. It's just 45 should. minutes of hiding from zombies and killing zombies and then it ends. Well, it's kind of that. I mean, like, it, they show a little bit of character development uh, with like Zoe. They show her before the outbreak, but they never like go back to it. But it kind of links her to one of the zombie types, the hunters. Um, I'll, I'll just go out and say they show her boyfriend dressing up as the hunter months before the outbreak so the uh, idea is he becomes um, spoiler alert yeah, the cross dressing yeah. transgender by the way what the fuck is cisgender I was reading something What is? does anybody know what cisgender means no. c-i-s gender I was, it was something I was reading uh, it was on twitter and I, I, I was like I, I, I couldn't even tell you. Or relating to a person whose self identity conforms with the gender that corresponds to their biological sex. A cisgender? So I am cock? It means you're just, you, you identify as who you are. So, so you're, you're a guy. It's you a identify redundant. as a guy. So normal. How about I can't, I, I can't just say I'm a fucking guy? I, I'm, you know. Well, it's a word for what you are. It's going words. into all that subcategory bollocks. Too no much. offense to anybody, but it's it's gone beyond a joke in Too my much. opinion. Anyway, uh, uh, my media yeah. that I've consumed is I uh, I sat down and read the new Harry Potter book yesterday in a couple of hours. It's nothing more than a screenplay, and uh, it was pretty cool. You know, I, I read those books a long time ago. I was a big fan. I was a midnight book sale kind of guy when I was way too old to be at the Harry Potter midnight book sales. I, in fact... You have the, like, the circular <laughs> glasses and everything. I didn't dress up, but when... I believe it was the sixth book that <laughs> came out, I was working at a bar, and we had a frat party or something that night, so we had to be there until 2 a.m., and at around 11.30, I say to my boss, I was like, hey, I gotta run. I'll be back in, like, half an hour. He's like, where are you going? I'm like, eh, I'll tell you later, but I'll be back. And he's like, all right. So I leave, I go to the midnight book sale, I get my new Harry Potter book, and then I go back to work at the bar, and they were like, what'd you do? And I was like, I went to Want the to Harry little... Potter book release, and uh, I got made fun of incessantly for weeks and weeks on end. Say hello. This is Bernardo. Hello. Hello, Bernardo. Hello, Bernardo. You're around the world. Is oh, he yeah. cleaning your house, Vince? What's going on over there? No, he just came back from school. Anyway, uh, the other thing that I watched last night was the uh, Ron Howard documentary that was called Eight Days a Week, The Touring Years, which is a movie that just came out on Hulu and in select theaters, which is basically a documentary following the early years of the Beatles and how they went from nothing to the craziest thing in the world and very quickly got tired of it and stopped touring. So if you have Hulu or you are into the Beatles, I highly recommend it. It is about an hour and 45 minutes and it was just very entertaining, shows lots of live performances and interviews with the band and even you know before John Lennon died and before George Harrison died and it was just very good very good entertainment so I highly recommend it I give it four full dicks four full dicks and the Harry Potter book four full dicks why not five well, who says that how about just ten's a good round number oh, why not a hundred t- you gotta stop somewhere I'm stopping at four dicks I don't want a fifth dick you gotta know when you're having too much dick basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five dicks is too many dicks. Okay. Says you. If we had opposable thumbs on our feet, then maybe I could handle five dicks. But four is all right. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, that's pretty much all we got to talk about now. Um, we'll be doing a few more of these coming up soon. Uh, just want to let you know we're going to have Rick Hunter 
on a future podcast. So if you guys want to uh, stay tuned, we'll have Rick Hunter. We're going to have Corey Cruz, who played the Postal 3 Postal Dude, come on as well. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have John Merchant back next time. He won't be too busy cleaning out his foreskin to be on the show. And, uh, you know, I that's wasn't. us. Do you guys have a good time? Was it a good show? You guys enjoy yourselves? I, my, my best to everybody out there. Thank you, as always. Without without the fans, we wouldn't be here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll try to contact Gary Coleman. I'll see if he's available for the next podcast. The ghost of Gary Coleman. The we should have it. flake that, ghost of should, Gary Coleman. We should have the ghost of Gary. Maybe yeah, I can I'll just, get make a, I'll just make a soundboard and you can interview yeah, him. I was about to suggest that. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, guys. Thanks a right, lot. Yes. Kurt, Thank you. Sign off. Yeah. Take care, Thank everybody. Thank you very much, guys. God bless. Bye. Have Bye. a good Thank evening, you. guys. Have a good evening. Same song, that same song can lead me to the bottom. When you the same song, that same song can lead me to the When you the same song, that same song can lead me to the sun. but they